I have printed out the description and I've left it in Martha's been in mind. But there's such a massive uh, variety of topics that you cover that I thought it would make sense to kind of focus in on one specific one. And also because myths is something I'm really interested in. So, I mean, I'm actually a Romanist, so I always feel slightly a fraud at these things because <laughs> my, all my research is on Roman art and Greek art, but I do teach Greek art as well. Um, I am interested in the ways that mythology is used in a variety of different ways uh, in art. So, essentially, I was going to kind of divide it into three parts. The first bit, just some uh, kind of methodological thoughts about ways to approach myths in Greek art, things to think about in terms of um, description and interpretation and contextualization. And then to um, discuss the Temple of Zeus to Olympia as a kind of case study for that. And then we'll do a little bit of, um, in the, the kind of last 10, 15 minutes, having a look at the replica vases as well, and just thinking about some of the ways that you can um, encourage students to, to really think about description as well as in interpretation. So I think one of the things I find with students when they come to university is they're often very good at telling me what something shows, but they don't tell me why they know that. They will say, this is an image of Hercules, and it'll go, why is it Hercules? You know, they go, well, because it says, Boardman says it's Hercules. It's like, yeah, but why is it Hercules? Why does Boardman know it's Hercules? So trying to sort of take them back sometimes to first principles and think about how do we know what we know um, and how well do we know what we think we know, you know, because some of it's kind of um, sort of building on what other people have said before and how reliable are our interpretations. Um, so that's broadly what I want to do. Um, but obviously we're a small group, so if anyone wants to just ask questions as we go through, do feel free to. Um, and I'm conscious that um, some of you, you know, you'll kind of be teaching this stuff um, and may well be talking about other things, and so do bring those in as well. If there's things I don't cover and you think, oh yeah, but I always talk about this, well, you know, why is that something mentioned that thing? That's fine, too. Um, I guess we could close the door at some point, of course. Yeah. I know we had a couple of people who didn't. Uh, I just mute you that way. Okay. No. Sorry, that's a bit of a tight squeeze. Um, okay, and the other reason I thought we'd get the replicas out is because we do have replicas of two of the vases that are on the prescription, so that might be nice for you to have a look at, which are the this one, the Dionysus um, Exequius Cup, and the Euthymidae Xanthra, which is that one. So, um, we have a look at these. Again. It's all priced. <laughs> no, it's one of these uh, uh, official replica kind of mm. things. Um, so, a slide, I think all of these are on that pack that um, Paul has given you, the resources, so the PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know, do, have any of you used, do you use the Beasley archive? I've missed part of Beasley as well, I noticed now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the link's right. So, because I think it's quite useful for. Um, showing students um, different vases, and also just because it has all things like the dimensions and further bibliography and stuff like that in it, but it has good photos. Well, some of them good photos, some of them less good photos. Um, but you can use the, if you use the browse function on the Beasley archive, then you can, um, in fact, I can demonstrate for those. So you can, Go down to if you go onto the basic search, then you can just um, search through things like subject, which is quite nice. So you can kind of go to gods and goddesses and look at all the uh, a variety of different um, images of a theme, for example. Um, I don't know whether it might take too long to load them. sent an email already with the links. I have, but I can I'll send it all again afterwards anyway. <coughs> yeah, so then it will bring it oh no no it's not why is that not showing on there? That's uh that's bizarre isn't it? It's showing on my laptop and it's not showing on that one. Um, okay, so you didn't see what I did then. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to. Uh, 
Okay, yeah. So if you go to the main Beasley page and you click on basic search and then you can go down to subject and then you can just drill into particular examples of particular people. Um, you know, particular labors of Hercules. Um, and then you can skim through different examples. So it's quite nice if you want to have a little look for some other examples that kind of complement the ones that you're doing at the moment. Um, the other one is the web uh, link, which is LIMC is actually um, a database of ancient mythology. So this is um, something that exists in a kind of printed version as well, a very expensive printed version, which we do have in our library, but not most libraries do. Um, so but it, there's a sort of subset of it on the web. Um, and again, it, you can just search by mythological character, and it will. This is will bring up uh, not just vases, but sculpture and things like that as well, um, across a whole different range of dates. So you can sort of do a search for something like Athena, and it could be something that you actually. Both of these are free to use, so it could be something that you give your students as a kind of homework task. You know, kind of, find out how many images of Athena or on pottery you can find or whatever. It's just, uh, it gets them. I'm not helped by typed Athena quickly. Um, it's low. We'll get to something more. Uh, yeah, so then you can kind of skip through different versions. If you click on them, you can then um, get more close-up versions and actually some of these images the link images tend to be better quality i think probably than the the beasley ones so um but link also links through to beasley so if you're um want to find out more information then you can go if it's a bar you can get back to the beasley one as well so that's just a kind of a uh, couple of web ones that i think are useful um if we go back to the, uh, in terms of books, I don't know what books you have, um, which, is it Boardman that people, I think is on the specification, isn't it, usually, but um, the, so in terms of general books on Greek art, um, the recent ones, I like Nia, which is this architecture of the Greek world, um, I think it's quite a good kind of overview, um, and that was, I think it was two two editions of that, that's the latest one, but there's, there's an early edition as well. And there's also one by Stansby O'Donnell, um, which is quite good as well, and Andrew Stewart. I, should, I didn't put these on here because I've put the sort of specifically mythological ones, but Andrew Stewart's book's a bit older now, the 1990 Greek sculpture, but it's really useful as a kind of, all the information's in there, it's got all the, the nitty gritty, it's got a good sort of stylistic description, and um, he covers both style and context. So I think he's quite good in that sense. Um, but in terms of ancient art, um, so for the uh, for, for ancient myth and ancient art rather, um, then there's there's some books which are kind of good overall introductions, um, which particularly the Woodford ones I think get used quite a lot. Um, and then uh, I really like Carpenter's Little Penguin, actually, after Myth in Ancient Greece. But also, if you're doing anything on the Trojan War, then the Shapiro Myth into Art book's quite good as well. So those are all a bit older, um, but I think mostly are still available. Um, I've just put the shuffle on there too, because he's got some good pictures. So those are, are things that you've got in your libraries. I think those are all useful. Um, but in terms of more, they tend to be quite descriptive, I guess, those. It tends to be kind of, this is how the myth is represented in art. Um, and so they're good at collecting the material together. But if you want to think more about why interpretations, um, what do these images mean in their context, say in their religious context, in their sympathetic context, things like that, then um, some of these other more recent works that I've put down the bottom I think are, uh, are really useful. Um, obviously, I know budgets are stretched <laughs> in all fields. So, um, if you were going to buy one for your for your own use or for your, uh, your school use, and I think probably the Barringer book is the one I I would recommend. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about some of her views 
a bit later. I don't know if anyone's have you come across Judith Fowler. She's on Maslow. Yeah, she's on Maslow, yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, she's um, I think her readings of the temple sculptures are really good. Um, and she also gives you so I've given you the her article on the Temple of Zeus at Olympia um, in the resources pack, which is the same as more or less as her chapter in here. It's just a kind of version of it. Um, but she does just some stuff on the Parthenon in here, but because Parthenon's been so written about, she's mostly focusing on the women in the Parthenon, so it's not as a kind of a double an overview of Parthenon as I think her treatment of Zeus at Olympia is. But that's definitely a good one. Um, and then I just sort of point out the others just because they are a bit more. Um, Probably a bit more theoretical, really. So both Giuliani and Juncker, in fact, all three of these are Greek, are, are German scholars translated. Uh, well, Juncker and Giuliani are German works that were written in German and translated into English. Lawrence is German but wrote in English, she taught at Nottingham for a few years and she's gone back to Germany now. Um, hers is, is probably too high, too complicated, I think, for A level. Um, She's, but it's quite interesting, so if you kind of get the bug and want to think more about the meanings of myth and ancient art, then she basically takes three different theoretical approaches and applies them to three different objects and looks at how the questions that we ask determine the answers that we get. Um, so I wouldn't recommend it for A level students, but if you're interested yourselves, and kind of, then, then it's quite an interesting book, but it's not an easy read, I would say. Um, and yeah, Giuliani and Juncker are both um, are quite interesting in terms of the, the sort of relating them particularly to ancient texts, um, so the ways that the myths and art are also represented in, in textual sources. Um, so, what I wanted to go to, back to the show, um, what I thought we could think about in terms of how do you sort of break down the teaching of mythology in art um, and how do you break down the way that people approach that is to think about sort of three different approaches that have been um, taken in scholarship. And I guess in some ways these, um, the, the first two, the iconography and the philological, are the sort of more traditional approaches, and then the contextual one is, is the approach that more kind of contemporary scholars who are working with Cart will be taking. So um, everything has to start with iconography, to start in, in a way, because you have to know what myth you're looking at and why you know that it's that myth. So the iconographical approach is, you know, how are myths told in Greek art and how do we recognise them, um, which I'm going to come on to in a moment in terms of the different ways that we, we, we recognise individual mythological narratives. Um, related to that, there's a kind of philological approach to these myths, which thinks about kind of how do the myths in art compare to the way that the same stories are told in literature. Um, and quite a lot of earlier scholarship on Greek art was very philological. It was essentially looking for the kind of the origins of these myths in literature. So saying, here's a picture of, of um, Hector being dragged by Achilles. We know about this from Iliad 22. Um, but one of the dangers with that is that, of course, images are telling stories in a different way than the ways that narratives tell stories. You can't do the same things in art that you can do in literature. So, um, and sometimes we, we just don't know whether it, we have a version of a myth on a vase, perhaps, that's not found in literature. We don't know whether that's because there was a literary version of this and we just don't have it, or whether um, actually there's the, there were sort of other stories circulating through drama, through our, you know, oral traditions, um, and that the art is tapping into those. So you can't always find a text that matches. Sometimes you can, um, particularly in Roman art, but in Greek art, quite often it feels as though the traditions of telling myths on, in art are running sort of parallel to the traditions of telling them in literature and not necessarily one deriving from the other. So it's not that literature comes first and then art is not that they're both developing side by side. Um, and then the sort of contextual approach would be what do these tellings, retellings of myth, mean in the context in which they're set and viewed. Um, and this is where I think Barringer's approach is, is quite useful. Um, but she's drawing on other scholars as well, like Robin Osborne, for example, who talked a lot about the viewer 
um, in the sort of 90s, early 2000s in his work. Um, but thinking about not just kind of what is put up and how is it represented, but how do people understand that? How do people experience it? Can you see the bits of the Parthenon frieze, for example, um, when it's hidden away in the, the kind of intersection um, between the, the exterior of the temple and the, the, the glass walls? So thinking about kind of what do viewers bring with them and what are they doing? So, um, and we'll see this when we look at the Temple of, of Zeus to Olympia. Um, so contextual approaches also mean thinking about, you know, who set this up, um, what context is it being seen in, so is it being seen in kind of religious context with temples, um, in times of festivals, um, is it being seen in the context of the symposium with images on vases, um, so thinking about how that affects the way that the same myth maybe is represented in different places. Um, and I've mentioned a lot in this book already. So, um, in terms of that sort of, you know, starting point, how do we see, how do we understand that something we're, we're looking at is a myth, how is a narrative told in an image? Um, then Woodford's um, introduction, well, her chapter in the Black Hole Companion is quite useful, and also her chapter, at, her, yeah, and her chapter in the Images of Myths book. And those are, I think, accessible to A-level students, they're about kind of, you know, how do you recognise that this figure is a particular mythological character through their attributes, for example. Um, and so, yeah, those, I've given you those and the resources, um, and also Carpenter's introduction. Um, and I suppose the, there are three ways, essentially, that we recognise something as a myth um, in an image. It's either through labels, um, inscriptions that are added to the, to, um, Sometimes these can be kind of inscriptions of the scene, but more usually they're inscriptions that just label some of these, they just give the name. Uh, we find that obviously quite a lot on vases, sometimes on architectural sculpture such as the Scythian treasury, but that's more unusual. Um, so at the end of the 6th century BC you get uh, inscriptions on the Gigantonic King and the Trojan War scene on the Scythian treasury, but um, generally not so much elsewhere in architectural sculpture until you go down to the Hellenistic period. Um, we find uh, attributes is the other way that we recognise people, so you know, Athena with a helmet, Hercules with a club, um, but that can be confusing as well, so someone like Theseus who also has a club, uh, distinguishing between Theseus and Hercules, you need to know, you know what are they, uh, the, the, the different um, situations that are in, involved in. Um, and then um, odd situations or juxtapositions of figures, which in a sense is the same, so it's kind of a visual uh, description of the scene which tells you what myth is being shown. Um, and sometimes it's through literary texts, references to literary texts. And the reason I've colour coded these is because um, I think it's quite interesting to know that all of these techniques that we as modern scholars use to interpret ancient mythological images were also there in antiquity. So Pausanias writing in the 2nd century AD, but um, describing the sites of, of Greece, um, obviously one of our main sources for ancient Greek art, although we do have to be careful because he's writing quite a long period after the images themselves are set up. Um, but he's describing the chest of Cripsilus, which is lost, uh, as is so many things, but seems to be in this wooden chest decorated with mythological images. And he goes through a number of these different processes in order to identify the figures on it. So he says, um, on most of the figures, there are inscriptions written in the ancient characters, so that seems to be his kind of go-to. If he wants to work out who's been shown, he looks at the inscriptions first. Um, but he also uses this idea of, of the representation of people in particular um, episodes which allow us to identify a particular mythological scene. So, for example, Heracles um, in the uh, episode with the Hydra. Heracles can be recognised by his exploits and his attitude, schemati, uses the... Um, he uses the Greek word schema to describe the kind of composition, I think, here. Um, so his name is not inscribed by him. Um, we might question Pausanias' idea that, uh, that inscription is always there just in order to identify people. I don't think that's necessarily the case, but anyway. Um, and then we've got the um, Here is Hermes. Um, 
the, oh yeah, so this is a different sort of inscription. So this is an inscription which is commenting on the action rather than just labelling people. So here is Hermes showing to Alexander that he may arbitrate on here at Athens and Mr. Aphrodite. There are a few inscriptions like that on vases. There's the, um, the games of Patroclus is labelled as a kind of caption on, I'm going to get it wrong now, I think it's the Sophilos Phenos, it's one of the two, it's like that with Francois Vars. Um, where the, the scene at the top is labelled as Aphrodite, so we've got the kind of the idea that the, the actual episode is being labelled rather than the, the figures. Um, I'll check, I can check that, and uh, if people want me to double check. Um, and then um, the other way he does it is, um, the, uh, so he gets one where he says there's no inscription, we can only conjecture what this means. Um, he has a grotto and a woman sleeping in it. And this is where he goes to his knowledge of ancient literature and thinks, who could this be? Man and woman in a cave. Um, I think that it's Odysseus and Circe because there are four women and they're engaged in the task that Ma Poma mentions in his poetry. So he's then using his knowledge of ancient literature to think about the interpretation. Whether that means whoever you know, constructed the chest of Kitzel has actually meant that to be um, the, the, the interpretation we don't know. But it's interesting to see that at least for a Roman that those sort of different approaches have been used. Um, so I think the other thing to think about is the kind of description of narratives and the way that images tell narratives versus the way that texts tell narratives. Um, particularly in the representation of time and space and the kind of focalisation um, of the picture. So you can't tell things sort of this happened, then this happened, then this happened. You have to pick the dramatic moment in many ways and um, foreshadow, the, the sometimes foreshadow what happened before and what happened afterwards. So there are sort of a number of different ways that that's achieved in art. There's what we might call the monocenic. Um, this is a term that Stanley O'Donnell uses, a sort of snapshot image of a particular moment. And then closely related to that is the synoptic, which essentially is, is um, focusing on one moment but foreshadowing bits of the narrative that can come afterwards by including things that haven't actually happened at that moment, um, but they're about to happen. I've got some examples in a minute. Um, diachronic, sort of series of, of, of images which tell the, the story um, in different episodes in time and then continuous narration where you have different moments in time but all within one composition which tends to come a bit later in art so not in the, the period of, of, that you're looking at. Um, so a good example of the monocenic one is the um, Achilles and Penthes layer bars by Dikias um, where we've got just that dramatic moment of him killing um, uh, and from that we expand and think about our knowledge of the myth, um, uh, whether this is sort of representing the moment in myth where Achilles actually, in later representations of the myth, is said to have fallen in love with Penthesilea at this very moment. Um, and it's a sort of open question as to whether that version of the story is known at the time that the um, vase painter was, was painting this. Um, Synoptic, I think this is a really good example of synoptic where you've got the kind of condensing of narrative. So this is um, the Hydria in Boston showing Achilles dragging Hector's body behind his chariot. Um, so this is, this is why I think that inscriptions aren't always about labelling people who we wouldn't know who they were otherwise. Because only two figures on this vase are labelled, Hector and Patroclus up here on Patroclus's two. So what we've got is we've got Achilles and his charioteer, um, Hector's body dragging behind the chariot, Hecuba and Priam standing under a um, porch, sort of looking on in grief. And then we have Patroclus's funeral mound here and the little uh, figure of Patroclus's spirit coming out of it. And um, it's fairly obvious this is Hector because there's not that many people who get dragged behind chariots in ancient myth. So we could kind of guess this is Hector. But I think the point of labelling him and Patroclus here is to make um, a contrast between the experience, these are the two people who died, these are the two people who are being grieved for in this story, uh, Hector by his parents, Achille uh, Patroclus by Achilles, and uh, Patroclus is receiving kind of honour 
sector is being desecrated and it kind of gives us an insight into the motivation of the action as well. Um, so there were also um, so the, the reason this is synoptic is because we have one moment in time which is the dragging of the body, but we also have this other sort of aspects of other moments in time, so the, the reaction of Hector and uh, Hecuba and Priam to Hector's death. The arrival of Iris to tell Priam to go and um, ransom the body of his son, um, and the funeral games and dragging of the body around the tomb of Patroclus as well. So it kind of refers to lots of different aspects from the end of the Iliad, but in one. So you say that's synoptic rather than diachronic? Yes, this is synoptic, yeah. And diachronic is where you have different episodes but they're represented in different um, images. So those images might be found one next to each other in metaphors, for example, but they're each complete unto themselves in one the unity of time and space is in one image. Um, it's, uh, it's just one episode in each image. So yeah, the Ladies of Hercules is the best example of that really. Um, from um, particularly examples like the one at Olympia where you actually get Hercules aging as he goes through. So you get the sort of youthful Hercules at the beginning and um, uh, the bearded Hercules at the end. Um, and so in later art, for example, when you get into the Hellenistic period, sometimes they will put those sorts of images all within the creation of meaning. So that can be from various different Side. It could be the artist who's creating the image. It could be the patron who's requesting a particular myth to decorate um, a temple or to um, uh, decorate a funerary monument later on. Um, and it can be the viewer as well. So what does the person who sees this myth, what do they take from it? And of course, all of those individuals may have different intentions and we can't always access all of them. We don't know. A lot of the time what we're doing is guesswork. Um, but it's important to think about them as separate people involved in the creation of meaning. Um, we can think about how it compares to myths and drama literature. So do they have the same meanings there? Something like um, the um, you know, myths of hubris that you find in uh, ancient drama. If we see something on the stage and on a pot to, to, to have the same meaning for its ancient viewers. Um, and then there's a question in terms of how much, how far should we go with interpretation? Um, how much should we read into myths, I think? Um, so one argument at the sort of minimalist stage would be to say, okay, there are workshop practices, you have set iconographies for set myths, people just copy them and, you know, uh, it's a temple, let's put an image of the uh, Gigantomachy or the Centomachy or something like that on it. And then at the other hand, there's some very convoluted interpretations of myths that say, well, you know, this particular detail reflects this local tradition or whatever. So it's, it's sometimes about kind of, I think both are true, um, but it's, it's where you kind of you, you want to focus, I suppose. Um, but there are things like constraints of the medium as well, so the, the way that the composition is affected by the area of a temple, for example, that's being depicted. So, you know, certain myths suit pediments much better uh, because you can, so something like Santomachy suits pediment very nicely because you can have your kind of um, the central figures and then you can have people on the ground in the corners and you can have a god in the middle to, to take up higher space. So thinking about the, the constraints and opportunities of the, the medium that's being used. Um, and then we might want to think about why, you know, what is important in this more generally in these societies. So myth is a kind of form of language that everybody in the Greek world understands. Everybody has a, a shared collection of gods, someone knows those stories, but they also have lots of different, multiple versions of those stories. Um, so in terms of sort of zooming in onto um, the sanctuary uh, of Zeus at Olympia in particular, um, I suppose these are sort of some questions to have in mind in terms of which myths are being used in sanctuaries generally, but then we'll look at Olympia in particular. So is myth when it appears on a temple about piety? Temples are in honour of the gods. Um, so the most basic explanation for myths on temples is that they're honouring the gods and their achievements. Um, or is it about the politics of the person who's paying for the temple? Um, and of course it can be both. Um, so for example, lots of readings of the Parthenon tend to talk about the aftermath of the Persian Wars and the, um, the fact that Athens has 
all this money from being part of the Delian League in the, the middle of the um, fifth century, and that they're kind of using the Parthenon as a way to establish their presence within the Greek world. Um, so playing up on the politics, but you can also look at the way that it is a, a monument of piety towards Athena and, and um, praises her um, and her achievements. Um, and then there were kind of readings that I guess think about the viewers, what the viewers might take out of this, um, but also think about what these the intended meanings that the person who commissioned the program wanted as well. So the extent to which these might be moral warnings that myths serve as a kind of models of behaviour to urge you towards or steer you away from, um, that they're facing the gods, um, and also whether they have origins as well, that they sometimes speak to kind of origins of the activities which are taking place in that particular area. Uh, and throughout all of this we can think about, you know, how is the viewer going to receive these as well. And of course, you know, people would have taken different things, so it's not necessarily the case that everyone's going to get the same message out of, out of all of these myths. Um, so if we look at the Zeus, Temple of Zeus to Olympia, um, it was paid for by uh, the Eleans, so um, the, the temple is paid for out of military spoils, so that's something important to remember, that Olympia is a place that brings Greeks together, but it also is a place where they celebrate their victories over each other as well, sometimes over others, but certainly over each other too. Um, I won't, I won't go through the details because I'm sure you know those, but um, in terms of dates and monument and measurements and all the rest of it, um, but it was the largest temple in the Peloponnese at the time it was completed um, and notable particularly for the use of marble in the decoration, in the metaphors and in the pedimental sculptures. Um, and so there's sort of three main areas in which um, the myths appear on the temple, the east and the west pediments, and then on the metaphors. Um, of uh, which celebrate Hercules. So we have um, on the east pediment the battle or the, the chariot uh, race between Pelops and Onomas. Um, on the west pediment the centromachy with Apollo standing in the middle. Um, and on the metapis six on the east, six above the entrance to the west, um, the um, uh, labors of Hercules, and those decorate the area across the, above the porch. Um, so, with the meanings of these, I think it's really interesting to think about the, the how we kind of construct that meaning. So, partly we do it through Pausanias, who gives us an account of what these images were, um, and partly we do it through the remains. Um, but the remains are fragmentary and the reconstructions are many, so um, and part of the problem is that we don't actually know how to understand Pausanias' text. So Pausanias tells us um, that in the front pediment, so the east pediment, the chariot race between Pelops and the Mass is shown, um, not yet begun, the preparation of the actual race is being made. He tells us that Zeus is in the middle, on the right of Zeus is on the Mass, and by him his wife Stereope, and on the left is um, uh, Pelops, Hippotamea, and Pelops and his charity and his horses, etc. Um, now, the difficulty with this is that we don't know when um, Pazio says on the right, whether he means Zeus is right or on the right as we look at it. And that's led to lots of different reconstructions. So this is the reconstruction, which is in Andrew Stewart's book and in quite a lot of other books as well, um, where we have um, Pelops on the right, uh, or on, on our left, on Zeus's right, and on the mass on um, the viewer's right. So this assumes that Pausanias talks about on the right as you look at it. Um, but the reconstruction that's actually in the museum has them the other way around. So it has... Um, Pelops on the uh, on Zeus's left and uh, Olivas on Zeus's right, um, and it depends partly on um, one of the sort of key factors that that distinct that people talk about is the angle of Zeus's head, which is unfortunately broken off. But from the from the little bit of the neck that remains, it looks as though he was looking this way, so he's looking to his right rather than looking to his left. Um, 
And, uh, but again, then scholars interpret that in lots of different ways. So it was he looking to his right, the right is the favourable side in Greek thought. Does that mean that Pelops was on the right because he's the one who's going to um, succeed? Or is he looking in kind of, uh, some people have said he's looking with anger, in which case it's on a mass who's cheating and, and kind of, um, who, who's, uh, well, yeah, I'll get on to cheating in a minute. Oinamas, who is going to be defeated and who um, kills all of the unsuccessful, um, uh, unsuccessful charioteers. Um, so, a question of, of kind of difficulty there. So yeah. Do you remember the victor is on the left? Am I making this up? Is, is, has anybody ever heard of this? That the victor is, is usually positioned to the left of the scene. There is to my left. Or is it <laughs> enters the scene from the left? Enters the scene. That's the thing. Is it that? Thank you. Well, well, there's a lot of art where the victor is on the left. Yeah. Hand I think she says it's actually. Yeah. So I, I'm just, I just think thinking of like Heracles and Antaeus, for example. Heracles overlaps from the left, yeah. doesn't he? Yeah. Um, the Metapetes as well, the Parthenon. But well, whether, whether that's yeah. a kind of standard thing or that's just a coincidence. Yeah, I'm now questioning if I'm at all being helpful or just muddying the water. But you are right, yeah, there's a, a lot of art that has, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I didn't know whether that's a, mm, a rule or not. So, yeah, that's interesting to bring in as well. Yeah. Because I think the point about divine favour and you favouring your right is mm. right, is correct. <laughs> um, to, to, but I don't know... I mean, ultimately, I don't think it matters that much, really, because... <laughs> you cannot tell this to my students. You know, they, are students. <laughs> they want to know. <laughs> Say this, yeah. I know, well, our students get very upset when we tell them that everything they, they know is possible, but not necessarily. <laughs> it's like Homer. Um, but anyway, so, but this figure here, on the left in this image, is on a mass, who's the... Oh, it's not showing up, but um, he's the older figure. Um, with the uh, cloak over his sides, and the figure who is uh, more naked is um, Pelops. Um, and so the other version, of course, is the which version of the myth, which I'm sure you are familiar with, um, which is, does this show you the version that by which um, Pelops won because he had better horses, because he has these winged horses which are given to him by um, Poseidon, which is told in Pindar's Olympian One. Uh, so Pindar says that um, Pelops um, went to talk to Poseidon and said to the god, um, restrain the bronze spear of Ananus, speed me in the swiftest chariot to Ellis, bring me to victory. And the god gave him a golden chariot and horses with untiring wings. And he overcame the might of the mass and took the girl as his bride. Or the treachery version, um, which is another version of the myth, which we only know about from later sources, but doesn't mean that it wasn't available earlier. Um, so the earliest sources that is Pericides um, in fragments, and then this is also told a bit later in Apollonius Rhodius' Archonautica as well, in more detail, um, where um, Mer uh, Pelops bribes Myrtilus's, Myrtilus, the charioteer of Monomas, to um, put wax instead of um, metal in the axles, and so when he's, when the chariot gets hot, the wax melts, and uh, on a mass falls to his death. Um, which ones do you reckon? I mean, have you do you come down on one side or another in your interpretations? Um, I suppose come down on the on the, the one about. Um, yeah, we, we focus on Myrtilus a little mm -hmm. bit just because of the positioning of the whole pediment facing the Hippodrome. Mm -hmm. And we're wondering about Zeus and his role of God as Justice. Is that the kind of reading, really, that yeah. should be going on there? Or, like you say, it's, that's just us, and someone mm -hmm. else is going to see something entirely different. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I think in, in many ways that has been the more moment mm -hmm. or is that the great foreshadowing moment and how much should we be reading into that guy's face about whether someone's going to cheat or should yeah. we be taking it all the way down to whatever Orestes is going to do to his mother yeah. three or four generations later. Yeah so yeah so that sort of foreshadowing um, the seer. So um, so I'm going to maybe put a plug in for the other interpretation which is also <laughs> <laughs> which is what Barringer does yeah. um, because I think it's interesting although I can um, I think she sometimes punches things a little bit that don't work. So, um, 
So she notes that the winged horses um, version is the one that we see on vases um, that predate this pediment. Um, so she's got particularly these two examples from the sort of um, 490s, uh, where, of course, in a sense, this this slightly this sort of supports her and doesn't support her because it shows that the myth with the winged horses is common and kind of the most maybe prevalent one. It comes from Pindar, it comes upon the vases at the you know in the decades before the temple is built. But the difficulty is that if you look at the horses on the pediment, you can't see any signs of wings. So. Um, and she sort of fudges that and says, well, the bits where the wings would have been are broken off, but I'm not entirely <laughs> sure that is true. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's possible the wings would have been painted on on the background, of course, so that is a, you know, we haven't got the... Um, but, um, yeah. So, but I, I, what I do agree with her is that in many ways it feels slightly odd to be drawing attention to Pelops's treachery in a sanctuary where he is such an important figure. So where we've got the Pelopidaeum next door, more or less, to the temple. And he is one of the key founders of the Olympic Games as well. Um, so, yes, you have the idea of, is this a warning against cheating? Um, maybe it is. And that does tie in with the Zanes. We know that there's the statues of the... Um, that were funded from fines that were levied on, um, on athletes caught cheating. But overall, I tend to think it's, yeah, I, I, I tend to go with Banjo actually and think it's more about praise of Zeus and praise of Pelops um, and, and kind of the etiology of this important contest in the game because the chariot race is. Um, Although the, the traditions about the Olympic Games differ, so the sort of a lot of the mythological accounts say the chariot race came first and then the later games were added afterwards. Although the Olympic victory lists always list the stage race as the first one and then say the other things come in later. So, um, but we know from kind of the earliest archaeological evidence that there are replica chariots being dedicated at Olympia in the very earliest period. So it does seem as though that's one of the earliest contests that's taking place there. Um, so I think that it may well be there as a reference to um, the importance of Pelops as a hero in the sanctuary and as, a, as one of the founders of the game. So I've got a sort of slide of all the different founders a little bit later. I realise I'm running out of time. Clark, here's a quick question. And yeah. Paul might be able to link to this okay. Just thinking about what you said about Greek religion, about how it would be strange to kind of... Um, show criticism on Pelops when it's, he's got the Pelopeian close by and people are actively worshipping him there. Um, from what I know of Greek religion, um, there's no moral aspect to being a hero in the ancient world and you can be worshipped for, for performing acts that we would think were horrific. Yeah. So would the Greeks be kind of okay with that inconsistency of having a, a criticism of their hero on the pediment, but also quite happy to worship him over here? Can those two things coexist? I mean, I think they can coexist because I think that Zeus is always going up to all sorts of stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we still worship him. But I suppose, so I don't think it, I don't think it's problematic if he's flawed and you're worshipping him. But I suppose it's more about if this is the etiology of your chariot games, then okay. it makes more sense to have a, a straightforwardly positive yeah. victor rather than a cheating victor <laughs> as your <laughs> kind of role model up there. But yeah, yeah but I, I agree with your point that you know you don't necessarily that heroes and gods aren't better than us morally. I think that's right. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Um, and then, yeah, I'm going to sort of speed up a bit because well, we're a bit short of time. Um, on the central monarchy, the central monarchy in some ways I think is a harder one to make sense of, apart from that sort of general, you know, um, Greeks versus others and sort of keeping control of yourself and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, Pausanias talks about the genealogy again. He says that um, he thinks it's because Periphus was the son of Zeus and Theseus was a great grandson of Pelops. Um, and that that's why they're there. Um, the other problem with this text, though, is that Pausanias says that Perithous is in the centre, whereas nearly all modern scholarship thinks it's Apollo. 
which makes a lot more sense because he's bigger than the two figures either side of him, who are the, um, the sort of hero figures here and here. Um, what so we just asked on that, the Alchemini's name, mm -hmm. um, do we know anything about, I have had students say, oh yes, it's by, and it's a fact, but none of the Woodville the textbooks ever seem to get, it's by Alchemini. So here is a new artist from the ancient world who can celebrate as if he was a new Phidias or a new Polyglitis. Yeah. Do we know much about him? Is it? Good question. I, it, I wonder if there's something in the back of Stuart's book, which I've left at home rather than in my office, actually. Um, I think we do hear about him elsewhere. I'm sure Stuart's got a section on him in Greek sculpture, but he's not as sort of celebrated in the same way. Yeah. But, it, but are we safe to teach him as a, a fact? To the yes, kids? I think you so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you can, yes, because yeah. Pausanias tells us that. So, I mean, yeah, I think Pausanias <laughs> tells us it's true, but, but yeah, I think we can teach it as a fact. And if you reference the fact that it came from Pausanias, you should get the tick for a scholar. Yeah. 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 Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so, I think. Yeah, one of the interesting things about this um, is, so these are sort of potential interpretations, is it power order of a disorder, is it, some people have seen it as a metaphor for Persian wars, um, although I don't know that I would, because of the context of the, the commissioning by Ellis, I'm not sure how much weight you want to put on the Persian Wars reading, that doesn't seem to be prominent necessarily elsewhere. Um, Banerjee um, has a Possibly slightly spurious <laughs> argument, um, but focusing on the way that this might have been read by people looking at it, um, she draws attention to the women on this and the fact that they are all represented with one breast bared um, and that this is actually the costume. Uh, you probably see that one in this, these images, but they are. Um, this, cost, this is a costume that the girls raced in in the races to um, Hera at Olympia. So, um, which we know, um, or which, no, we don't know. We, it's been suggested that uh, men were able to watch those, and that unmarried girls were able to watch the men, and that this might have been a sort of, um, a kind of, um, not exactly dating, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> so, watching it, watching it, it's a your kind of, um, uh, the, the bodies of the, the your future spouses, essentially. Really <laughs> so yeah. Um, so we've got. So that's quite an interesting meeting. But I think I do think it's slightly harder to work this one out, except for. And she also talks about the the holes, so the sort of wrestling holes that are being used in these images and in the metapiece as well. Um, but again, I think it works a bit better for the metapiece. Um, so my point about the metaphor is, is that um, Hercules is here as a kind of role model for all the victorious athletes who are going to compete at Olympia, which seems to me to be very, um, very likely. Um, so, uh, yeah, that hasn't left us very long to look at the vases, actually. But um, let me just, I won't, well, we'll skip over Hercules there. Um, just give you the slide on history of games causing to Pausanias. Um, just to show you how you know, almost you can make any, any argument work <laughs> because Hazanius tells us that uh, there was a, a Cretan Hercules who initially founded the games, but Zeus wrestled with Kronos for the throne here and then set up the games. He tells us that Pelos held the games in honour of Zeus, and he tells us that Hercules are. Heracles, or, or the famous Heracles, um, helped them as well with uh, various other people taking part. And Heracles won victories at the wrestling in the Pancratium. So actually, for Pausanias, all of these figures were important in the history of the games. And, and I think that is significant that Heracles, uh, and we know that even before Pausanias, Heracles is the kind of the, the athlete par excellence. Um, so people who are uh, victorious in both the, pa the Rath Slaying and the Pancratian are called the followers of Hercules in later um, in the Roman period. That's their sort of official title. So I think one of the things to think about is kind of is praise of the gods, but I think there is also allusions to history of the games. I think there are maybe moral messages there. Um, I think there's definitely resonances with activities in the sanctuary and then this sort of demonstrating of kind of models to aspire to as well. Um, so I've also given you on Hercules the, the rest of old um, chapter in the, um, the materials as well. 
Um, and then we doesn't leave this very long to vases, but you only want to have a quick look at the vases. So just to um, just really so you have an opportunity to have a look at one sort of take that and they're fairly robust. So uh, <laughs> you're gonna have to disappoint it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On an interpretation, there's sort of this is Zeus as the god of Daiki. The old man as well, which I don't know what Nosworth yeah. was very keen on going. Yeah. What is this guy seeing? Which I loved your ways before of the uh, is it just a single moment? Mm -hmm. Or is that the great foreshadowing moment? And how much should we be reading into that guy's face yeah. about whether someone's going to cheat? Or should yeah. we take it all the way down to whatever Orestes is going to do to his mother yeah. three or four generations later? Yeah. So yeah, so that sort of foreshadowing um, the seer. So um, so I'm going to maybe put a plug in for the other interpretation, which is also <laughs> <laughs> which is what Barringer does. Yeah. Um, because I think it's interesting. Although I I, I I think she sometimes fudges things a little bit that don't work. So um, <laughs> so she notes that the winged horses um, version is the one that we see on vases um, that predate this pediment. Um, so she's got particularly these two examples from the sort of um, 490s, uh, where, of course, in a sense, this this slightly this sort of supports her and doesn't support her because it shows that the myth with the winged horses is common and kind of the most maybe prevalent one. It comes up in Pindar, it comes upon the vases at the you know in the decades before the temple is built. But the difficulty is that if you look at the horses on the pediment, you can't see any signs of wings. So, um, and she sort of fudges that and says, well, the bits where the wings would have been are broken off, but I'm not entirely sure that's true. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's possible the wings would have been painted on on the background, of course, so that is a, you know, we haven't got the um, button, yeah. So, but I, I, what I do agree with her is that in many ways it feels slightly odd to be drawing attention to Pelops's treachery in a sanctuary where he is such an important figure. So where we've got the Pelopidaeum next door, more or less, to the temple. And he is one of the key founders of the Olympic Games as well. Um, so... Yes, you have the idea of, is this a warning against cheating? Um, maybe it is, and that does tie in with the Zanes. We know that there's the statues of the, um, that were funded from fines that were levied on, um, on athletes caught cheating. But overall, I tend to think it's, yeah, I, I, I tend to go with Banjo actually, and think it's more about praise of Zeus and praise of Pelops. Um, and, and kind of the etiology of this important contest in the games, because the chariot race is, um, although the, the traditions about the Olympic Games differ, so the sort of a lot of the mythological accounts say the chariot race came first and then the later games were added afterwards, although the Olympic victory lists always list the stage race as the first one and then say the other things come in later. So, um, But we know from kind of the earliest archaeological evidence that there are replica chariots being dedicated at Olympia in the very earliest period. So it does seem as though that's one of the earliest contests that's taking place there. Um, so I think that it may well be there as a reference to um, the importance of Pelops as a hero in the sanctuary and as, a, as one of the founders of the games. I've got a sort of slide of all the different founders a little bit later. I realise I'm running out of time slightly. Clark, there's a quick question, and yeah. Paul might be able to link to this okay, just thinking about what you said about Greek religion, about how it would be strange to kind of... Um, show criticism on Pelops when it's, he's got the Pelopeian close by and people are actively worshipping him there. Um, from what I know of Greek religion, um, there's no moral aspect to being a hero in the ancient world and you can be worshipped for, for performing acts that we would think were horrific. Yeah. So would the Greeks be kind of okay with that inconsistency of having a, a criticism of their hero on the pediment, but also quite happy to worship him over here? Can those two things coexist? I mean, I think they can coexist, because I think that Zeus is always going up to all sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We still worship him. But I suppose, so I don't think it, I don't think it's problematic if he's flawed and you're worshipping him. 
but I suppose it's more about if this is the etiology of your chariot games, then okay. it makes more sense to have a, a straightforwardly positive yeah. victor rather than a cheating victor <laughs> as your <laughs> kind of role model up there. But yeah, yeah but I, I agree with your point that you know you don't necessarily that heroes and gods aren't better than us morally. I think that's why. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Um, and then, yeah, I'm going to sort of speed up a bit because well, we're a bit short of time. Um, on the centre of the king, the centre of the king, in some ways, I think is a harder one to make sense of, apart from that sort of general, you know, um, Greeks versus others and sort of keeping control of yourself and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, Hazenius talks about the genealogy again. He says that um, he thinks it's because Perthus was the son of Zeus and Theseus was a great grandson of Pelops. Um, and that that's why they're there. Um, the other problem with this text, though, is that Pausanias says that Perithous is in the centre, whereas nearly all modern scholarship thinks it's Apollo, which makes a lot more sense because he's bigger than the two figures either side of him, who are the, um, the sort of hero figures here and here. Um, what so we just asked on that one, the Alchemini's name. Mm -hmm. um, do we know anything about I have had students say, oh yes, it's by. Is a fact, but none of the Woodville the textbooks ever seem to get it's by Alchemini. So here is a new artist from the ancient world who can celebrate as if he was a new Phidias or a new Polyglotus. Yeah. Do we know much about him? Is it? Um, good question. I, it, I wonder if there's something in back of Stuart's book, which I've left at home rather than in my office, actually. Um, I think we do hear about him elsewhere. I'm sure Stuart's got a section on him in Greek sculpture, mm. but. He's not as sort of celebrated in the same way, yeah. But, it, but are we safe to teach him as a, a fact? To the yes, case? I think you so. Yeah, yeah I think you can, yes, because yeah. Pausanias tells us that, so, I mean, yeah, I think Pausanias <laughs> tells us it's true, but, but yeah, I think we can teach it as a fact. And if you reference the fact that it came from Pausanias, we get the tick for a scholar. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. Oh, yes. Um, so I think. Yeah, one of the interesting things about this um, is, so these are sort of potential interpretations, is it power of order of a disorder, is it, some people have seen it as a metaphor for Persian wars, um, although I don't know that I would, because of the context of the, the commissioning by Ellis, I'm not sure how much weight you want to put on the Persian Wars reading, that doesn't seem to be prominent necessarily elsewhere. Um, Bamager, um has a possibly slightly spurious <laughs> argument, um, but focusing on the way that this might have been read by people looking at it, um, she draws attention to the women on this and the fact that they are all represented with one breast bared um, and that this is actually the costume, uh, you can't really see that one in this, these images, but they are. Um, this, cost, this is a costume that the girls raced in in the races to um, Hera at Olympia. So, um, which we know, um, or which, no, we don't know. We, it's been suggested that uh, men were able to watch those and that unmarried girls were able to watch the men and that this might have been a sort of, um, a kind of, um, not exactly dating, <laughs> but, but <laughs> sort of, putting up, putting up to lay your kind of, um, uh, the, the bodies of the, the your future spouses essentially. Really <laughs> so yeah. Um, so we've got so that's quite an interesting meeting. But I think I do think it's slightly harder to work this one out, except for and she also talks about the the holes, the sort of wrestling holes that are being used in these images and in the metapis as well. Um, but again, I think it works a bit better for the metapis. Um, so my point about the matter is, is that um, Hercules is here as a kind of role model for all the victorious athletes who are going to compete at Olympia, which seems to me to be very, um, very likely. Um, so uh, yeah, that hasn't left us very long to look at the vases actually. But um, let me just, I won't, well, we'll skip over Hercules then. Um, just give you the slides on history of games causing to Pausanias. Um, just to show you how you know, almost you can make any, any argument work <laughs> because Hazanius tells us that um, there was a, a Cretan Hercules who initially founded the games, but Zeus wrestled with Cronos for the throne here and then set up the games. He tells us that Pelos held the games in honour of Zeus, and he tells us that Hercules are Heracles, are, are the famous Heracles, 
um, help them as well with uh, various other people taking part. And Heracles won victories at the lessening in the Pancratium. So actually, for Pausanias, all of these figures were important in the history of the games. And, and I think that is significant that Hercules, uh, and we know that even before Pausanias, Hercules is the kind of the, the athlete par excellence. Um, so people who are uh, victorious in both the, pa- the Battle Slay and the Pancratium are called the followers of Hercules in later um, in the Roman period. That's their sort of official title. So I think one of the things to think about is kind of is praise of the gods, but I think there is also allusions to history of the games. I think there are maybe moral messages there. Um, I think there's definitely resonances with the activities in the sanctuary and then this sort of demonstrating of kind of models to aspire to as well. Um, so I've also given you on Hercules the, the rest of old um, chapter in the, um, the materials as well. Um, and then, we well, doesn't leave us very long to look at vases, but you only want to have a quick look at the vases. So just to... Um, just really so you have an opportunity to have a look at one of the things that take that and they're fairly robust. So um, you're going to have to disappear.